I would like to explain why, in fact, it's important and why you can't understand, not just food systems, but why you can't hope to intervene in a positive and productive way without looking at this gender disaggregation in addition to other important disaggregations as well. It's often the case, I think, that, you know, when we, I, uh, let's face it, all of what we try to do is social engineering at one level, even though we may not like to think of it that way, but we all want change. We all want what we consider positive change, and we want to improve the world in a way. When we do this, we come with certain assumptions, we come with the best possible motivations, and we often are unaware of how these will play out in different social and cultural contexts. I think that point was made already by Nikita, that you know, we, we need to be aware of the contexts in which we operate. I think it's fair to say most of the contexts we operate in are patriarchal. Because, you know, let's face it, most societies are still patriarchal in different ways and to different degrees. And so that is a common underlying theme. But then that in turn has many implications for how different economic processes play out. So often when we intervene, we are intervening in structures and in processes which already have a certain momentum and the interventions may well have the opposite effect from what we intend, simply because we haven't thought about how those differences work. This is sounding very abstract in general, so let me try and elaborate this in a couple of ways. You know, the discussion on agriculture and food production particularly has recently become aware of the fact that women are the dominant producers of agriculture. It's also true that, let, that gender is a buzzword globally in the international donor community, etc. You know, it's, it's, it's very motherhood and apple pie to say gender is good and, you know, you have to look at it and so on. But it is also the case that more and more now we recognize that you wouldn't really have agriculture in most developing countries without the active engagement of women in a productive way. This is not something that always comes out from our data. And that's a very big aspect that I will touch on. But it is also not something that is at all reflected in policy making. And it is also not reflected in the legal and institutional structures that govern production, distribution, consumption. And I'm going to try and highlight some particular areas in which this matters, uh, which I think are absolutely crucial. One is in terms of access. Access to resources, access to, you know, uh, resources broadly defined, including to land, to water, to, you know, the range of things that are necessary for agricultural production, to credit, to knowledge, to inputs, as was mentioned earlier access broadly. The second is, well, I, the one word that would capture it is invisibility of women's work. The continuing invisibility of women's work, which means that often the statistical data we use simply doesn't capture the extent to which women are engaged in the productive process. And so when we go out there armed with all this background data that we have looked up in, you know, in terms of the number of women engaged in agriculture and in this crop and in that crop, we actually have no idea because the data themselves do not capture it. I'm, I'm going to hope to give you some examples of this. The third uh, crucial area is about consumption, which again was mentioned just now, and how, if you like, distribution, intra-family, intra-household distribution matters crucially, how culturally determined that is. So often, you, you know, it's not as if women and girls are deprived. It is self-deprivation often. It is uh, that they choose to deny themselves while encouraging, let's say, the, the young males in the family rather than the, their own consumption and so on. And finally, I, I want to end on a, well, I won't end on that, but I want to mention a slightly depressing note. And that is about, if you like, the possibilities of um, reversal. And I think we have to come to terms with that. In the last decade, we have experienced significant reversals in many parts of the developing world and in the developed world. In the world, we have experienced reversals in terms of not just gender empowerment, but broadly speaking, equality, uh, social justice, and things that would, in general, make the world a better place. Okay, so those are the four things I want to cover. Let me just begin with the first, of access. 
We all realize that women in general are less likely to have land titles, less likely to be recognized as the productive leader, less likely to be recognized in terms of, shall we say, you know, controlling irrigation supplies, other assets, financial assets for sure. For all these reasons, they are much less likely to get bank credit. And therefore, when they are producers, supposing they are actually recognized producers in their own right, nonetheless, they're much more disadvantaged simply because their costs go up. Clearly, if you don't have the land title, so you don't get any of the, you know, the extension services that are generally provided to farmers, you don't get the access to institutional credit, you don't get a whole range of other things, then obviously your costs are going to be higher. What's the solution? Can we go out there and demand in every country that you have to start giving every woman land titles? Can we make that a condition of donor aid? No, probably not, because it will be seen as something that you, know, you can't. What it does mean, though, is that we shouldn't fall into some of the obvious traps that have been developed to cope with this. So, for example, the fact that women in general have been denied institutional credit has led to this emergence of microfinance as the alternative. I think that, you know, it's a bit of a cop-out. Real finance for the men, microfinance for the women. You know, I think we really need to recognize that we have to think of creative ways of ensuring institutional finance access to all producers. That's the first. And that, in turn, can be done in many ways. It can be done, for example, through, uh, you know, uh, interest rate subsidies that are provided to banks because there are higher transaction costs when you don't have collateral that you can show as assets. There, you know, uh, forming cooperatives which are not the microfinance cooperatives necessarily, but with women operating together or women and men operating together in a way that would enable all of them to access the finance and so on. But there is a, one very important way in which I think we must make a difference and that is to move away from the household-based delivery and provisioning. Because the minute you use the household-based provisioning, you are actually falling into all the existing social cultural norms that, that have already, if you like, been imbued with patriarchy. When you say every household will get so much land, well, guess who gets the land title usually? Maybe you have joint titles, it doesn't really help. We've seen that in India. When you get a joint title with the man and the woman, it's not that it makes a huge difference. Maybe you demand that only the woman gets the title. It doesn't always work. We found that in many parts of the country, in India, for example, it's led to more violence against women. So it's a very complicated deal that we have to enter into. These are very deep social cultural norms that you have to confront. If you move away from a household base, you're much less likely to be dependent on a male breadwinner model. You're more able to move into individual access. Now, this is a huge shift, I think, that will be required because government policy everywhere is household-based, everywhere. So it, it requires a massive shift, and it would require a huge amount of not just creativity, but energy, I believe, on the part of donors as well. But I really do believe that as long as we stick to the pure household-based patterns, of recognition, delivery, access, the works, we are unlikely to resolve the problems that emerge because of the fact that these households are constructed along patriarchal lines and society is constructed along patriarchal lines. So that's one. The second is about the invisibility. Now, you know, we like to say that more women uh, are engaged in agriculture than men, which is, of course, the case that comes out from our data. But what we don't realize is the extent to which agricultural production is dependent on women. Why don't we realize it? Because even when the data show us that there, you know, dominantly there are women and so on, a lot of the work that women do is still invisible. And that's because of the fact that work itself has been defined in a very restrictive way in our data. You know, we tend to think of work, and I'm going to get a little technical here, but you'll realize why it is actually important. The work that, when we look at employment data, it's all based on the, a certain definition of what work is, right? Of course, because otherwise, that's why you get so many people, women, who say we're not in the labor force. 
yeah, we're not working because we're at home, we're doing care work or whatever it is. Now, the way that work is defined is if, in fact, it enters the system of national accounts because you are producing for something outside the household unit. And that is the underlying notion that is used in all statistical systems across the world. So if you're producing anything for within the household unit, it is not seen as work because it's not entering the national income. Okay? Well, in fact, that's going to change, I hope, because one of the good things that has happened in the world is that the International Conference of Labor Statisticians actually had a conference in December 2013 where they decided to enlarge this definition of work. And they have now accepted a definition of work in which including household activities is an essential part of work. Now, this makes a lot of sense because, you know, the minute a household outsources some activity, that enters the national income and the person who it is outsourced to is defined as a worker, right? So, if you hire an agricultural laborer, that's work. If, on the other hand, your wife does it, that's not, she's not a worker. There was this famous um, case, I forget which Englishman who said, oh, if I marry my, ho my housekeeper, then the gross national income will come down, right? Because of the fact that she will stop getting a wage. She will be doing it within the household. Clearly, there's a conceptual flaw in treating only, only that which is done for outside the household as work, because all of this, it's not just that it is uh, entering into people's real consumption, but also that it's essential for keeping an economy going. Okay? It's not, and a lot of this work is not just social reproduction. You know, we think of the care economy, we think of looking after children, well, having babies, looking after them, looking after the rest of the household, looking after the old, the sick, etc., the care economy broadly. We think of that as this, if you like, social reproduction. But a lot of the work that women do is well beyond that. In addition to social reproduction, there is the aspect of productive activity, which is often not recognized. Whether it is kitchen gardening or there's poultry keeping, whether it is weeding, which is often not recognized as an essential part of the agricultural process, whether it is the minor irrigation, and so on and so forth. There's a huge range, whether it is the marketing, it is the processing immediately post-harvest, there's a lot of work that women engage in which is simply not recognized as work because a lot of it is not marketed. Now, once we recognize this, it actually emerges, and there are a few statistical systems that actually allow this, that women are hugely involved in agriculture to the point where they dominate in agricultural production. In my own country, in India, our statistical system shows us that women have a really low work participation rate. I mean, shockingly low. In rural India, it's now it's, it's fallen. It was already only about 36%. It's fallen to about 30% of the work of the women in the age group of 15 plus. Tiny, yeah? Ridiculous. I mean, unimaginably small. But because we have survey data, the same sample survey that gives us this low work participation also asks them about what other activities they engage in. And if you include these other activities, that is to say you include all, all of the things I've mentioned, not just the care economy, but the, you know, the kitchen gardening, the fetching, the carrying, the water, the weeding, the poultry, etc., etc., you end up with 84% workforce participation compared to 76% for men. So more women are working than men, and most of that is absolutely essential for cultivation and for food in general, okay? So it makes a huge difference to recognize this. Now, once you recognize it, then there's another set of issues. What are we doing about it? What do we care about the fact that it is unpaid labor? Do we just say, well, that's fine, women do it, so good. Just as well that they do it, because otherwise society would be in bad shape. No, I think we have to recognize that as far as this unpaid work is concerned, we have to have a particular approach. We have to first of all recognize it. That is to say, demand social recognition of its productive contribution. Not necessarily add a number to the GDP, but to say, look, this is all essential work that is entering the national income. So you give it that social due, you give it social recognition as work. Which means these are women who are recognized as workers and would be entitled to all the benefits that workers are provided socially. 
whether it is pensions or you know, what have you. Second, we try and reduce the unpaid labor as much as possible. A large part of the unpaid labor of women in developing countries is also taken up not just by those, the care economy and productive activities, but the sheer provisioning of essential household consumption. There are women in, again, India, who walk for six to eight hours a day to fetch fuel, wood, and water for their households, without which those households and those farms would not survive. There are women in rural Africa who also have to walk huge distances for water, and so on and so forth. So provisioning becomes a huge part of the time taken. If we want to reduce the time, the arduousness, the drudgery of this work, what do we do? Well, we have to think then of the interventions that would reduce it. Piped water, massive time saved. Piped energy sources, huge improvement in the time saved. So, you know, if you don't have that priority of reducing unpaid work, then you don't actually think of those as the most important interventions in an economy. But it can make a huge difference once you've recognized that there is all this productive time being wasted in these, which could be employed in more use, socially useful activities. Sometimes not recognizing it again has this opposite effect of even well-meaning interventions turning out, as I said, opposite of what you intend. And again, I'm sorry to keep giving you examples from India, but I, I know that case better. Uh, in India, we had an afforestation drive in the 1990s. Which, because, as you know, our forest cover had been declining and so on. And this was a very well-conceived afforestation drive, done with a lot of, in fact, donor assistance. The World Bank, I think the Swedes, the Norwegians, a lot of people were involved in this. And it was very well thought out. It was based on the notion of decentralized village-level farm uh, forest management committees, which would have a member from every household actively participating in it. And you would cordon off sections that would then allow those forests to regenerate. And it worked really well. We got, I think, 3.4 percentage point increase in the forest cover. I mean, it's generally seen as a huge success. But studies that have been done in eight states of the country showed that this, because you cordoned off a lot of the, the local nearby areas, led to a massive increase in the time that women had to travel to fetch fuel wood. In India, appallingly, fuel wood still accounts for the basic energy source for 85% of rural households. Shocking but true. Now, when you cordon off the nearby forest, you are forcing women to walk further and further. Fine, why did that happen? Well, because the Forest Management Committee had a member from every household, and guess what, it was always the men. The men don't walk to fetch the fuel wood. It didn't even occur to them that that's a big deal. Okay? So they didn't make that a priority. How can you change that? In one state of the country, in West Bengal, in one district, they applied a different notion. They said all of these members of that committee have to be women. In other words, it has to be the woman from the household. And what they did was very different. They said, okay, we will cordon off this forest, but we will a certain amount of time every day between seven and nine, allow a certain limited access in certain areas so as to allow fuel wood collection. So you got both. You got the best of all worlds. You got a reduction in the labor time to collect the fuel wood, and you got a regeneration of forests. But you got it only because the people who had to do that unpaid labor were in a position to make that decision. So it's that kind of thing which can dramatically affect how policy plays out. And that's why the recognition of the role of gender is so important. Another aspect of inv invisibility that I just want to briefly mention is, uh, is the whole is aspect of post-harvest, if you like, uh, the, whole, the whole system of post-harvest uh, processing and distribution. And here again, it's one of those things where women have been largely invisible the role played by women across the world in the immediate post-harvest, uh, not just the threshing and the grinding, but you know, the, uh, the collection, the storage, and the subsequent preparing for purchase within households is not even counted as work. 
In many of these surveys that statistical systems typically employ in developing countries, these aren't even mentioned as activities. It's just assumed that, you know, you cultivate this thing, it grows, and then bam, you pick it up and you give it to the shop. <laughs> we all know it doesn't work like that. There is a huge cycle of post-harvest work and distribution, and a large part of it is done informally, <coughs> typically by unpaid labor of women. Now, this too is something which has a huge potential for not just technological upgradation, but for once you recognize the work of women, you will start thinking seriously about how to reduce it, how to make that actually something that is more efficient and frees up other time for different kinds of activities. And also you will think about how to increase the value added at each part of that chain. So thinking about improving the technologies involved, it's a shocking to believe this, but in most parts of the developing world, we still don't provide minimum cold storage facilities in every rural settlement. That would be, you would think, absolutely essential if farmers want to actually retain their produce for a minimum amount of time. How will you ensure, for example, decent storage facilities? How will you ensure technologies that enable faster grinding, faster processing, cleaner processing, that would meet various trade standards and so on and so forth? These are all, you know, it's not rocket science. These are very simple things to do. They are not big things that are requiring huge investment. But we don't think of them because we don't actually think of that whole part of the food system as a big deal. It's all getting done anyway, quietly, invisibly, so we just take it for granted. But if we actually treat it systematically, there's a huge potential for increase in value, and there's a huge potential for increase in value specifically of the women's work involved, which is currently unrecognized and unpaid. One of the areas I think that we have ignored, we used to talk a lot about it in the past, and it's fitting that we are in Italy, which I believe is still an inspiration for the cooperative movement. I think that we, did, we haven't really given enough significance to cooperatives in the area of dealing with the post-harvest produce and the subsequent distribution. And we haven't thought creatively about how to make these cooperatives not just you know, something nice you're doing for the, a bunch of women out there as a welfare measure, but to make them really strong, competitive, viable market enterprises, which is what they're meant to be. So I think we have to develop the business model for cooperatives, specifically for women, recognizing the context and the role and so on. And we have to do that in a way that simultaneously reduces the drudgery and arduousness of the work, but also increases the value added of that work. Now, this is a complex thing because we are talking about a world in which more and more of this is now being taken over by large chains. Agriculture is one of the areas that is getting vertically concentrated more rapidly than possibly any other area that I can think of. So it's not just that there are the big five companies globally that are engaged in marketing and in input delivery, but that they are also vertically integrated. And that means also that increasingly we're moving to large-scale systems for this rather than small-scale. The trouble is that we have not seen an integration of the small with the large. What we've really seen is a displacement. The large comes in there and throws out employment. We've seen this in sub-Saharan Africa big time. We have seen that as you get the large retailers or the large producers, you move more into a plantation mode, which is often called contract farming rather than plantation, but it's really the same thing. You move into that, and you move into mechanized processes, well, mechanized processing and distribution, which, of course, displaces a lot of labor, but really leaves smallholder cultivation at a tremendous disadvantage. Now, we have to counter this. I believe the only way to counter it is through cooperatives, because that will also give you those advantages of economies of scale. That would also give you access to both credit and technology and markets in a way that you would not have as an individual smallholder. But those cooperatives have to recognize the huge role played by the women. So once again, away from the household orientation, away from one person from every household, go directly to the people engaged in that process and make cooperatives from them or composed of them and so on.
So that's, if you like, the aspect of invisibility. Then there is the aspect of consumption. Now here too, we have a very complicated world. We, have, we, we are experiencing changes in patterns of food consumption that I think are almost unprecedented. And a large part of that is because of the growth of multinational food supply. Uh, multinational corporations role in food supply. I, I'm not trying to make out that there are these big bad creatures out there who are swallowing everybody up and so on. But what I do, I think, uh, want to point out is that the growth of, well, ICT, of course, which has dramatically spread uh, the possibilities of advertising, the demonstration effect of particular food patterns in the north permeating across developing countries, and the spread of large multinational retail, especially in the food sector, has created some major dislocations. It has created a dislocation between the local producer and the local consumer. I was in Estonia <coughs> recently, and uh, they used to ha they have very fine beef, you know, farms and so on. But they cannot access the local beef because everything has been taken over by multinational. That beef goes somewhere else. In their supermarkets, they get beef coming from you know everywhere else in the world. And so, you dislocate between local production and consumption. Secondly, you dislocate between local habits of food, which are often very uh, much more, uh, shall we say, responsive to climate, to, um, you know, your own physical characteristics, because, you know, some parts of the world have been lactose resistant or something, the other, which are much more, shall we say, suited to particular populations. You shift from that to one homogenous pattern of food production, and people will accuse me of being extreme because it's true. I mean, that, let's say McDonald's, when they come to India, they can't serve beef. So they serve these chicken burgers and so on. But shall we say broadly, the, the certain kind of food production is now widespread across the world. And that has massive implications because it has led to different uh, kinds of morbidity and disease which are completely unexpected. Perhaps you, you may know, for example, Papua New Guinea, the explosion of, um, uh, what is that, um, cholesterol-related diseases, because suddenly they're eating all uh, the fatty parts of meats and sausages and things which they really were not used to eating traditionally. In South Africa, you have, among the poorer families, malnutrition and obesity in the same household because of the fact that you have peculiar, really wonky patterns of food consumption. In South Asia, you, in Bangladesh, in parts of India, workers are substituting the consumption of biscuits, which are, you know, processed white meat, white flour based, etc., etc., for the traditional uh, breads that they would make at home because those are labor saving and quick and they don't really have the time because they have to do all these other things, which has huge health implications. How does this play out for women? There is a significant increase, which we do not realize, a significant increase in reproductive health diseases, which are resulting, according to many doctors, from hormonal changes resulting from diet change. And somehow, we don't think about this in the developing world, you know? Shall we say, I'm in the land of the fast, you know, slow food movement. And I, I, the things that you now talk about, think about, and are very conscious of, we are so far from appreciating these in the developing world. And we are so quickly losing the advantages we had in terms of local, seasonally oriented produce, healthy, natural, organic produce. We have lost all of those. We are moving towards a much more chemically based, non-seasonal, uh, not just, you know, carbon intensive, but unhealthy diet, which is driven by these consumption patterns which in turn are driven by the marketing and advertising of large companies. This has very big implications because it leads to peculiar forms of malnourishment. It's not only undernutrition. Sometimes it's poor nutrition which comes from a different kind of too much nutrition. And we again have to bear in mind that if you want to look at these in terms of how they play out, you have to think about how specifically you can target women who still remain the basic provisioners of consumption in the household and ensure that there is a different 
set of choices available, which is not seen as wildly expensive, which is not seen as the luxury of the elite, but is seen as something desirable. We have some very nutritious food staples in India, some food grains, which uh, uh, ragi, jowar, bajra, which are, um, I, I suppose at some point they will become the quinoa of the West, okay? They're really good for you in many different ways. They lower your cholesterol, your blood pressure, you know, you name it. Now, this used to be the traditional staple of many poor families across Central and North India. But the, uh, if you like, the sort of, the advertising revolution has made everybody think that these are inferior food grain and what you should really be having is wheat and rice. And so now, even when they serve these in the schools, the mothers come and say, no, you're giving my child inferior food. You give them wheat and rice. Don't give them this inferior staple. So we have to also deal with that aspect of the food system. I want to mention this aspect of reversal. It's very painful for me to even think about it because it's one of those horrible realities you hope to shut out. But I think we have to recognize many of us grew up with the idea that things will keep getting better. You know, maybe a little sideways and maybe a step back, but then three steps forward. But overall, things improve is how we somehow thought of the world. We now have to recognize that it doesn't necessarily work that way. And recently, especially, there have been huge setbacks for women's empowerment across the world. It's not just in terms of education, how much harder it is today if you are a rural a woman in uh, Afghanistan to educate your daughter, or in Pakistan, or in Iraq, where some of the most educated women I knew, nuclear physicists and so on, are unable to educate their own daughters. But also in terms of the basic functioning of women in all of the other aspects that we've been talking about, the unpaid labor aspects. Even in my own country, in India, there's a reversal in terms of the recognized work participation. It's moved back to within the household. They've gone from paid to unpaid work. And this is true across a number of countries. What do you do in these such situations? How do we cope with this possibility of reversal? How do we, when in our interventions, try and put in the seeds of change that will not get destroyed either by, shall we say, patriarchal reaction or by social political changes that, you know, not just threaten security, physical security, but also dramatically reduce the possibilities of empowerment. Now, this one, I ha don't have an answer. I really don't. But I think it's a huge challenge, and I think we, are, uh, we will be living in a fool's paradise if we don't accept this. That even in countries that seem quite fine and safe and good and democratic and so on, things can change. And they can change very rapidly. I mean, I have, my friends in Egypt have got horrible stories. And it comes from both sides. It comes from the Muslim Brotherhood and from the army. Uh, so I think we have, to, we have to recognize the possibilities of reversal. And so when we go around thinking of policy interventions or you know, exam pilot projects, programs, all the things that we like to think about, we have to bear in mind that these have to be tough. They have to be not invincible, of course, but at least resilient in terms of coping with possible and often dramatic and sharp changes in the social political environment, which are unexpected for all of us, and which certainly we don't like, but we still have to live with. So, a Saudi woman I know described it to me very well. You know how they have so many restrictions on their mobility. She says, you have to be like a fish swimming in the water. You swim around the big fish, and you swim in particular ways that allow you to survive. I think that's maybe how we have to think about the world today. It's not a, it's not a hopeful, you know, it's not the big, you know, let, let the revolution come and everything be wonderful. It's not that. But it is, um, it is surviving in a world in which that survival has become more difficult for a lot of women. So, okay, I, I'm sorry, I've talked for too long, but let me, let me then end with a couple of questions that I have for you. I have, I would be interested in knowing how, do you feel that some of the, the, shall we say, donor strategies or policies that your uh, resources have assisted, have they inadvertently actually worsened problems sometimes? Or could they have in the absence of not recognizing some of these things that I've been talking about? Second, supposing you actually did have to change for the better, recognizing cultural context. 
then what would you do? It's not just enough to educate women. In fact, in India, we now realize it's really educating the men. I mean, really educating them, not just putting them to school. Uh, but how do you do that? How would you ensure, if you like, the social cultural change that is essential if you want to re actually genuinely enable a viable set of food systems that recognizes the contribution of women? Third, how would you actually go about reducing it? I've mentioned some ideas I had in terms of reducing unpaid labor, increasing access, and so on and so forth. But these are very tough questions, and they're culturally specific. So how would you do it? And finally, that last question, which, how do you ensure survival of positive interventions? How do you make sure that the institutions are put in place, or that people's minds have changed, or that approaches are now so widely recognized that they cannot be just overrun by a political change? Uh, these are very tough questions, but then you're all working in this area and you know much more about it than I do. So let me end here.